right? Effective team operations. When you're looking at effective team operations, here's some of the very key important points. Uh, when you're looking at uh, building your team uh, to be effective, uh, accountability is always going to be number one. You need to have a personal accountability. Every team member uh, must hold themselves accountable and must be willing to do that. Um, if you have a team member that's not willing to hold themselves accountable for the responsibilities that they uh, are taking on, uh, then that's going to lead to a lot of friction uh, in the team. All right. Uh, next, we go down into systems and processes. So this allows um, it's kind of that grease and allows you to scale a team. Yeah. Everybody always talks about systems and processes. Um, like it's some kind of buzzword, um, but nobody really does it. I, I know for us that I'm fairly good at understanding how to build a system process, but actually doing it is uh, consistently and the discipline to use them over and over again is, is a lot harder than it sounds, um, especially when you're scaling your operation. So that's why you need to make it a focus. And that's why it's on this slide. Uh, it's very, very important to have, um, to, to be always thinking about working on the business instead of in the business. If anybody's read that, the uh, Michael Gerber book, uh, The E-Myth, that's where this is coming from, is that at some point, um, you know, systematically and periodically throughout the calendar year, you and your team need to get together and have like an offsite or a, a, some kind of multi-day event where the only thing you're focusing on um, for that for that day or that hour or whatever it is, is what are your pain points? What are your bottlenecks? Look at your um, look at your your KPIs as a group, as a team, and figure out okay where where's the bottlenecks? Where's the uh, where's the um, what's the words I'm thinking of here? Oh, next works good. So where's the pain points of this thing? What are these? What are the tasks that I'm doing that gives me the most frustration, takes the most amount of my time, um, that is taking me away from other higher level tasks I should be doing? Those are the type of the questions you need to be asking yourself. Use tools like um, I'm, I'm big into Lean Six Sigma, so I, I pull a lot of tools over like uh, the Pareto analysis, which is essentially the 80/20 principle, um, which is 80% of your results from come from uh, 20% of your effort. That same principle also works in reverse when we're talking about systems and processes as well, where 80% um, of your you know frustrations and things like that comes from 20% of your systems and processes. So that, that rule works in reverse as well. So you should always be looking at yourself, uh, looking at your, your business from, you know, step away, you know, step up top and kind of look down at your, the way things get done, almost like a um, if anybody's ever heard of spaghetti charts, that's another tool to use of figuring out, you know, from going from A to B to from, from a task start to a task completion, what are all the steps and all the things and all the people's hands that touch this one thing uh, in order for it to get to, you know, the end of its, you know, journey. Uh, once you actually draw this out and literally they call it a spaghetti chart because um, a lot of people think they have it straight in their head of what a task looks like or what a process looks like. Uh, but then to actually draw it out, it looks like, you know, crazy, like a, a child, you know, took some crayons and drew all over a piece of paper. Um, so spaghetti charts, Pareto analysis, uh, bottleneck analysis, um, SWOT analysis. These are all tools in the, the Lean Six Sigma tool belt. Um, I have plenty more too, but um, those are the ones I, I mainly use uh, for trying to figure out where's my inefficiencies and how do we get after fixing them. Uh, the best way to do it is create the white space. That's the first step is to create the white space with you and your team. Uh, like for Tri-City, we do ours um, weekly uh, for us where we can step back well, quarterly for the entire team, um, weekly for uh, uh, Duke and I as the, the visionary and integrator. Again, if you read Traction, you know what those teams are what that sub team is and to where we don't, we don't talk about the business at all. All we do is talk about, okay, what's working, what isn't, and how can we uh, make our, our processes more effective and efficient. Um, and that's why that one's on here because you should always be looking at working on the, on the system, on the business rather than in the business. All right. Now we're moving down to vision and goals. Um, everybody needs to be aligned. Uh, there's a bunch of, you know, cool quotes on this from like John Maxwell or 
Jim Rohn or, or I like the ones from Steve, uh, Steve Covey on vision and goals. And it's essentially everybody needs to be bought in to the same, uh, everybody on the management team, leadership team needs to be bought into the same um, core values, the same ethics, uh, have the same goals or similar enough goals. Uh, and uh, also very importantly, timeline to achieve those goals. And last month, uh, we had talked about that of, um, you know, if you have some team members on your, on your team where their goal is, you know, 50 units in, in five years or something like that, since we're talking multifamily, which equates to maybe, I don't know, $5,000 a month or something. And then your goal is, well, I want $20,000 a month is my goal. You know, that, that's going to work good for a little bit until you achieve that first goal. So once you achieve that 50 units for that first person, what do you think their work ethic is going to be like um, and their drive is going to be like to push the team forward? It's probably going to start falling off because they've already achieved their goal, right? Their goal was 50 units or $5,000 a month or whatever it is. And yours like, hey, we're only a quarter of the way there. Like mine's $20,000 a month. And now you got this person who's, you know, they're, they're ready to sail off to the sunset, um, you know, drink Mai Tais on the beach because they've achieved everything they wanted. And that again, leads into friction going back up to accountability um, because, Hey, they signed up for a job and they're not, you know, they're, they're not doing it because it's not anybody's fault. It's just, you didn't have the conversation of what are your actual goals? Uh, because, you know, they're not, you're not rowing in the same, uh, same direction. Another analogy is uh, for the vision and goals is making sure that um, when we have the visionary and integrator of the team, uh, so whoever it is that sets that initial goal, uh, is that you're all rowing for that same goal as far as, um, hmm, let me put this in a uh, analogy would be like the ladder, the ladder analogy, like you don't want to, you know, work for five years or 10 years uh, to, you know, climb this ladder and realizing that it's leaning against the wrong wall. That's another thing that I see uh, a lot of teams do. And you have to be cautious of that because you get, again, back up in the systems and processes. You get so busy working in the business for years and years and years that by the time you pull your head up um, and, and, you know, look around, you realize that you're like, you know, 100 miles, you know, off course and what your original goal is, what you really wanted, what you really set out for. Uh, to achieve in this business venture or whatever it is. So getting very clear on the key where there's clarity uh, on what the vision is for this organization, um, what the goals are, what the actual KPI goals are, and uh, what the timeline is. Everybody needs to be bought in on that on the management team. Uh, it's very critical for, for long-term success. Um, and then we go over to trust and respect that's at the bottom because it's the foundation. Uh, everything needs to have uh, start with trust and respect for all the team, uh, all the team members, you should be able to talk openly and candidly about everything that includes criticisms and things like that. Um, that's just the foundation of any effective uh, team is when you can't trust another person um, or, or feel like they don't respect you. Um, then you're going to have issues and they're probably not going to go away uh, and just going to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, so trust and respect needs to be at the forefront of every decision uh, and interaction you have as, as a, you know, as a team. So these are nothing new for most people. Um, they sound pretty simple. They're incredibly hard to implement consistently. Uh, and I said, I can, I've been in the military for 15 years and this is something that we are that's like drilled into us every single day to work on these things for our organizations. And it just never goes away. It's, just, it's a constant, uh, it's a constant thing that we always have to work on. Um, and the second you start slipping on any of these, then the team starts degrading um, and the, the effectiveness and um, production of it starts going down as well. So um Again, yeah, very, very simple concepts to understand, very hard to, uh, to do consistently. You need 100% buy-in from everybody and you have the discipline to do, to actually do the steps here. All right, moving on. All right, so here's some uh, tactical uh, tools 
that we can use some actual actionable steps here. So uh, work first one on the left is going to be level 10 meetings. Uh, so this level 10 meeting, uh, again, comes out of the book traction is where we get this idea of having a weekly meeting where uh, pretty much has the, the agenda of almost like how we set up with the, this, uh, this course. And we always start with new, new um, or this uh, meeting. So new things, everybody shares wins, things like that. And we go into KPIs. So everybody on the team or every seat on the team, I guess it's, it's more based on the, the role, not the person. So every role is given, you know, KPIs, key performance indicators on that's how we judge their effectiveness on how they're doing their job. So it's usually a number based. Um, if it's how many leads you generated this, this week, how many deals you underwrote, how many brokers did you talk to, how many investors did you talk to, whatever it is, it's a, it's a very definite number that we can use as a, you know, essentially a, a gauge and uh, keep track on a scorecard of their progress and, and the, their ability to achieve their, their KPI, um, you know, their, their job. So we go over KPIs and we go status updates on any kind of projects. Uh, that we have so we go down project by project what's going on with leasing what's going on with um yeah leasing uh repairs maintenance any kind of issues with uh, uh capex projects that we have in work the finances of it investor relations with them and just go line by line right now i think we have five or six properties um so that usually takes about i don't know 45 minutes an hour and then after there we start um talking about issues with generally the entire company uh, at the company level of like, okay, what are we, what issues are we having? And right now for us, it's things like hiring VAs is, is a pain point. So we have all these little tasks that we want to pass off, but VA uh, actually getting effective and good VAs is, is a lot harder than um, just going on Upwork and just picking some random person. Um, so you know, that's just kind of one of the pain points we're dealing with now is hiring uh, VA. So we, we tabletop that problem. We talk about, okay, how are we going to solve this? What, what course of action do we have? Um, you know, we kind of debate our issues and then we come up with a course of action and carry on with it. Uh, so this meeting is level 10 meeting. It's weekly, uh, very important to keep everybody on track and uh, keep the mission um, going. I'm still in a uh, military mode. I just got out of work like an hour ago. So that's why I'm talking things like COAs and missions and things like that and KPI. So please excuse that. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, the reason pulse checks are effective um, is because, which is a weekly level 10 is called a pulse, uh, also called a pulse check is because um, people, humans are very um, prone to procrastination. It's very much human nature that we don't do anything unless there's a deadline or definite with like a consequence if we don't get it done. So we usually get a deadline. We usually do nothing, and um, uh, we usually do nothing. And then right before the deadlines do, then we hurry up and like our activity, uh, you know, spikes up and everything like that. So the reason it's called the pulse check. Imagine like a, like an EKG meter. You know, the pulses of a heart. So imagine one of these meetings. Every time a meeting happens, it's one of those pulses because every time no, everybody knows a meeting's approaching. Then all of a sudden, I have to go on here, see all the stuff, my deliverables for the weekly meeting, and then my activity is going to spike, right? And then I get a lot of stuff done, and then we have the meeting, and then it's going to go down a little bit. And then the next week comes and it spikes again. So you can kind of trick your you know, human nature of it, I guess, by having more meetings. So by having a weekly meeting, you have more pulses. So you have more activity surges than you normally would have if you had say monthly meetings or, or quarterly meetings. And that's why the weekly level 10 or even better if you, if you guys uh, can come with like a very efficient compact uh, like daily meeting of just like a five or 10 minute you know, daily uh, huddle, um, those are usually called, that even, it works even better because now it's a daily pulse where you get, you know, that, um, you get the steps that you need to do or the tasks you need to do you get that surge of accountability. It's like, okay, the team's counting on me. Let's get it done. I need to have answers by this date, right? But it, or by tomorrow, they're going to expect some kind of result from me, right? Because um, the team is going to hold me accountable and I should hold myself accountable, right? Go back to the accountability at the, the chart. So by increasing the frequency of your level 10 meetings, we do ours weekly, then 
you get a lot more done. And it every week, it doesn't seem like you're doing a whole lot. But you look back, you know, at the quarter, you look back at the, um, you know, the, the, Q2, the end of Q2. So for us, it'd be June 30th. You look back and you're like, holy crap, we got a lot of work done. And a lot of that's driven off of those weekly accountability checks in those level 10 meetings of constantly, you know, focusing on the business, looking at KPIs, uh, hashing out issues that we have, um, and, and knowing that you're going to be held accountable at the group for the work that you're responsible for. All right. So then we go down to quarterly meetings. So quarterly meetings is, is a quarterly meeting. Um, most businesses operate in, in the U S um, generally uh, operate very effectively off a 90 day lifespan. So the um, that's just how it is, you know, businesses in the US, it's a 90, a 90 day calendar, 90 day uh, business cycle. That's how most of your things get done is quarterly. Um, so you should have uh, a quarterly meeting. The first objective is it to, is to vet, vector check on your annual goals. So at the end of every 90 days, you know, everybody's working, you kind of look up and you're like, okay, where are we at toward, toward our, uh, our one year goal? If our one year goal is 2000 units, uh, how do we need to do we need a course correct um, and, and get back on track? Um, or did we just blow our, our annual um, goal out of the water and we need to pick up the, you know, stick and throw further out, um, meaning the goal, the year, annual goal, uh, because we didn't set a big enough goal. Or maybe we set a too lofty goal and like, you know, are we going to tailor it back because, you know, we're not going to achieve it or do we press in harder, lean forward harder and, and, and go all out and try to achieve it. But that's where these quarterly meetings happen. These are usually uh, supposed to be like, like a day long, maybe even two days long uh, meetings um, where the weekly level 10 is usually like, I don't know, we do ours in about two hours. Um, so two hours once a week, we kind of go over the whole state of the state of the company quarterly, usually about a day. Um, we try to knock that out. Uh, it's getting harder because of COVID. And then now we're, we're all moving off Island. Um, but you can see on here. So vector check on the annual goal, uh, review and establish your next quarter's rocks. So your rocks are like, what are the, what are the priorities of that quarter? You should only have one to three rocks every quarter. Um, everything else is just kind of busy work, but you should only have like one to three, like, no shit. These are the, the our, our priorities that we're trying to achieve. Everything else is second to these rocks, these goals, these quarterly goals. Um, you define those, redirect all your resources and efforts to achieve those uh, quarterly rocks. Provide feedback to how everyone's doing on the uh, on the group. Again, feedback goes into um, you know trust and respect. I should be able to tell everybody on on the team um, honest feedback if they're you know. Maybe they they don't see what what's happening, um, and they need uh, some feedback on on that. Uh, and then grade performance. I don't think we did grade performance uh, at a personal level. Um, we did at it as a, a KPI level, um, but the intent is to grade performance at a at a personal level. Um, so somebody knows like where they stand or where the, the group thinks they stand uh, collectively, um, and get some some feedback on how to improve uh, just because if they're not aware of, you know, whatever. So next one, we go to annual. So annual meetings, this is uh, usually uh, the best works if you do like an offsite. So this is where you get the team, you shoot over to like Maui for a weekend and you turn off the phones, you turn off all the social media, turn off the kids and you focus on the annual meeting. You're going to review the entire year uh, interview, see what your original goals were, how you, how you measured up to your, your original, uh, goals for the, the last 12 months. Um, keep track of lessons learned. Okay. Like we, Hey, we totally botched this, or we, we should have caught this sooner. Um, things like that are like, we really need to improve this system, this process. We need to create this new position to handle this. All that stuff happens at your annual, uh, goals. We can do a lot of CPI exercises. That's why I like Things like the SWOT analysis, pick pick charts, gap analysis, spaghetti charts, um, value stream mapping. These are all kind of buzzwords of the Lean Six Sigma tool uh, toolkit. Uh, very very effective, but they're also very time consuming and um, require a lot of attention. So that's why doing the offsite 
is the best. Uh, I think we had to cancel our offsite this year. So hopefully next year I can fly back, Matt can fly back and we can do a, an offsite um, at the end of this year as we focus toward our 2021 goals. All right, all this is in, in, in intent, hold on, forget. Uh, so all this is to get you know very clear, get that clarity on what the goals are, how you're gonna achieve them and get that buy-in from everyone on the team. Everyone needs to be rowing in the same direction at the end of these meetings, okay? Um, and if they're not, that's this is where you hash it out. And maybe you need to bring somebody else on the team that will uh, you know, buy in and put in the, the energy and commitment it takes to achieve what the business goals are, all right? Cool, good there. All right, some more tactical tools here. So cloud, cloud-based document control, that's one of the biggest things I see um, when scaling and, and developing systems and processes is the discipline uh, to keep document control. And again, this is very hard, it's easy to talk about, very hard to implement because you're getting like 100 emails a day, you're signing documents left and right, you got DocuSign, you got Adobe Sign, you're doing LOIs, you're getting contracts, all this stuff are coming from everywhere. Um, and you need to keep it organized. And the best way we found, um, and like right now, I'll tell you, I probably rate me on this as like a, like a B minus, maybe even like a C plus, because it's, it's really hard. Like I, usually at the end of at the weekend, like on Sunday, I'll go back and like go through my entire email, look at anything with an attachment and then uh, put it in the folder. It's going in because at that moment, it, uh, yeah, so much going on. It's really hard to, okay, download this thing and put it in a folder where it's supposed to go. Uh, cloud-based, I think it's a must these days, um, especially when you're dealing with teams where you're not all going into an office. Um, so we use Google, Google share drives. So where it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter where the team members is, um, you have access to those documents. So that is very important to have a cloud-based document control system. And everybody has the discipline to know, here's the folders, here's the process. And put the, anything you sign needs to go in one of these folders for continuity um, and control. All right, uh, web-based CRMs and project management softwares. Uh, we use Asana is one of our main softwares we use. And I, I think we've done um, some videos on that before. Uh, Asana is really, really good for task management, project management, uh, creating workflows and processes, repeatable processes, um, process templates, things like that, task templates. It's very, very good. The free version is pretty robust. We don't even, um, for us, Tri-City, we don't even pay for the, the paid version yet. Um, we're probably getting there to where we're gonna have to pay for it soon. Um, but the free version is very robust. A lot of other people use um, like Monday. Uh, Monday.com is a very um, popular one. I think Trello, Pod, Podio, I think is another popular one. Uh, we, we like Asana, that's, that's one we go with. It's very robust, uh, cloud-based. You can, you can add, you can collaborate on projects. You can add attachments to it. You can add timeline due dates. It syncs with Google calendar. So it shows up right on your phone of what tasks you need to do today. That's great. Uh, for CRM, we use active campaign. That's pretty much the gold standard of CRMs that I know of. Um, extremely robust. You can do things like automation, um, not just keep a Rolodex of, uh, of your contacts, but you can create lists and tags and sub lists and automation threads and drip campaigns and all this stuff, uh, right in active campaign. You can take notes, you can send emails, newsletters, all that kind of things um, right from that system. So for CRM, I think active campaign is probably the best. All right, all right, what's down the rope? All right, uh, going up here, lose the ego. Uh, that's one of the biggest things I see newer investors failing when it comes to team is, um, or newer teams fail, it doesn't matter if they're investors or not, just teams in general, is people's egos uh, get in the way, whether they know it or not. Um, and real estate's very, very much a team sport. You're never gonna be able to get very far by yourself. Um, so best thing to do in any kind of team uh, effort is lose your ego, be a team player um, and kind of the best thing I can say about that. And if you need uh, kind of help understanding that, one of the best books I read on that is, um, cause it sounds easy. Like, oh yeah, just don't be a jerk. Uh, it goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, 
because you may have reactions to things or make decisions and you don't really know why you did that. Um, so Ego is the Enemy by Ron Holiday, outstanding book on the subject, um, really kind of wakes you up um, to certain things like that. All right, hold yourself accountable and do the work. Nothing builds resentment faster than a shirker. So a shirker or a social loafer are, are just terms where, um, uh, again, human nature kind of thing, where somebody would be on a team and they put in um, you know, minimal effort because they, they're thinking the, the rest of their slack is going to get picked up by the team around them. And that usually works. Um, in the military, anybody that's been ever in the military knows exactly what I'm talking about because um, there's a lot of these people out there and we have to kind of catch them and, and, and either get them out or correct them um, because it brings a team down extremely fast. It brings, it builds resentment really fast. It kills the motivation of the people that who are actually performing. Um, so if you're going to, if you're going to sit in a seat uh, and, and sign up to do a job, hold yourself accountable to it. Uh, the other team members shouldn't have to hold you accountable uh, for the work that you're, you know, supposed to be doing. Um, and, and, and worse, picking up the slack, right? Because uh, that, that only works for short, short bursts, right? Short bursts of that. And then after a while, if it's consistent, it builds a lot of, uh, you know, resentment. All right. So going on, embrace the vision core values. We must all be rowing in the same direction. Hey, I think I just said that like about four times. Okay, so moving on to that one and be clear and transparent on compensation before you get into a deal. Uh, so this is also very important, especially if you're working with a new team members that you haven't worked before or you're collaborating with another team. Say you might have two or three people on your team and you found a deal in whatever, uh, Indy or something like that, you know, 50 unit deal in Indy and there's a couple of team members there and you want to collaborate and everyone's excited. So everybody jumps in, they start working and everything like that. And then like a month goes by and then you start having to do cap tables and stuff like that for the lenders and, and uh, figure out what the equity share is of the GP or, or the JV, if you're going to do a JV partnership. And then th you realize that this is the first time you, anybody has actually talked about what the splits are going to be and what the compensation is going to be for each slice of that pie. Um, and that's probably the worst time to have that conversation. Um, we did that on one of our deals and it sucked. Um, so we took note of it, lesson learned. We went back, reflected, like, wow, we really jacked that up. Let's not do that again. You know, always have those reflective conversations of, okay, what's the lessons learned? What did we do wrong? You know, kind of the hot wash, the debrief after, after action um, conversations. Uh, and we, we usually do it after every deal. Um, that we do of like, what are the things we did wrong on one of our deals that we, we messed this up where we waited too long to have this conversation. And uh, it was, it was annoying. So be very clear upfront. Um, if you're going to start a team, understand what roles people are going to be doing and what the compensation for that role is, because not all roles are going to be even to go into a deal saying there's, you know, Hey, there's four of us. We're all going to be 25% partners. Um, and, you know, whatever, right off the sunset, um, that may work on a JV, but it may, or it may work on one deal, but on the next deal it may not work. Um, because some roles are going to require a, a lot more time and energy than others, just based off of just the nature of the work. Um, or uh, some roles require a lot more risk. Like what if one of the roles is being a KP, uh, which is a key principle, the person guaranteeing the loan, right? And it's just that one person, like that person's guaranteeing the entire loan. Well, obviously they're taking on a lot more risk than the other partner. So if that's not addressed and, and talked about like, well, you know, I'm taking on a lot more risk here than, uh, than you are, and we should address the conversation. Then you're getting to like the closing table a week out and having this conversation. Um, it's gonna add a lot of friction really fast. Um, so have those conversations upfront uh, and you'll save yourself a lot of trouble uh, so get very clear on your goals and your structure of your team and the compensation.